He's a very unusual guy who's written a very unusual book. Uh, he's a hotelier who built the Joie de Vivre uh, Hospitality. No, wait, Joie de Vivre Hospitality. That's right, that's the name of it. You got it. Uh, which was a, a chain of boutique hotels. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of retired from that. And uh, then you went to work at uh, Airbnb. Uh, and you became um, the uh, head of global hospitality and strategy as they were trying to rethink some of the scale of what they were doing. And, but you, in effect, became a mentor uh, as an older guy to Brian Chesky, the CEO. Um, and you came out of that with a series of insights about the relationship between the generations. And now you've written a book that's doing very well called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. So and I, as a old guy, considerably <laughs> older than you, I, I find it, I don't know, I don't know about that. Oh yeah. Don't How old work. are you? Don't, don't, don't. Come on, out yourself on stage. How old are you? I'm almost 67. Oh. See? Was, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to win. Okay? I'm 59. Okay, 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 okay. Look, it takes a while to get right. something done in this world. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, anyway, so uh, I want you to talk about your, kind of the fundamental insight you came to. Yeah. You know, it, we, are, we are older people, um, mm -hmm. uh, and probably this audience skews a little old, but um, the workplace skews increasingly young. So what does it mean? Certainly in Silicon Valley. Uh, and I think power is skewing young, not just in Silicon Valley, with seven of the 10 most valuable companies in the world today being tech companies. All companies want to look like tech companies, as evidenced by WeWork. <laughs> um, so I think the thing that's interesting is that Brian said to me, Brian Chesky, so I was, this is seven years ago, Brian asked me to join Airbnb to be his in-house mentor, but to have these roles of being head of hospitality and strategy. But about three months into it, he said, you know, your knowledge isn't all that important here. And what, was, what I said, what do you mean? And he said, it doesn't really matter how many, maid, how many rooms a maid cleans in an eight-hour shift. And I said, yeah I, yeah, I get it. But then he said something right after that. He said, you know what? We hired you for your knowledge, but what we've really gotten is your wisdom. And to be quite honest, I didn't know the difference. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? And what I came to realize is that um, what he said then after that is you have process knowledge. The fact knowledge is good, but your process knowledge of how to get things done, understanding humans, is what wisdom is. And so over the course of the last seven years, my role at times has been to understand how do you integrate creativity, intuition, emotional intelligence, understanding organizational savvy of how you get things done in an organization, um, which is not something a younger entrepreneur has any experience with. Um, and how do, you, how do I help guide him um, in his role as the CEO? So it's been seven years. It's been, it's been four years as a full-time role, and then almost three years now as a strategic advisor. And you've also got this thing now, which is called the uh, um, Modern Elder Academy, um, which is a place to learn how to be more effective as an older person, more or less. Yeah, right. and let's look, you know, the average age of the person who goes there is 52, so this is not elderly. <laughs> this is the, not the modern elderly academy, it's the modern elder academy, and the difference between... In Baja, that, California. In Baja, California. Beautiful an hour, place. Uh, an hour north of um, Cabo San Lucas on the Pacific Ocean, um, four-acre campus right on the beach. So the premise was this, is it's 60 years exactly this year since Peter Drucker coined the term knowledge workers. Um, and while none of us put knowledge worker in our LinkedIn profile, the truth is the, that the, what he said is the power of the, of the workplace in the future will be you know, led by knowledge workers. And that's true. But one of the things that I've started to say is, well, maybe it's time to retire the term knowledge worker and replace it with a wisdom worker. And what in the heck is a wisdom worker? Well, it's that difference between what Brian said to me of he hired me for my knowledge but what I really offered was the wisdom. Wisdom is really sort of the interesting corollary or bookend to the AI discussion that's going on. It's like, how do you take values? Um, how do you take uh, creativity and intuition? How do you take EQ and understanding the collective consciousness in a room, being able to read a room as someone leading a meeting, and use those skills and help pass those on to younger people? Um, I had seven direct reports when I joined Airbnb um, seven years ago, average age was 27. Average age of their employees was 23 and a half. Um, and none of them had any experience or background 
in leadership or management. And that didn't mean they weren't potentially going to be quite good, but we don't have sort of learning and development programs to microwave emotional intelligence and leadership skills. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm believing is it's time for us to say, yeah, instead of sort of seeing this as a generational war of boomers against millennials and Gen Xers or Gen Xers, I, Gen Xers are obviously the bridge generation. Um, which, you know, which do they side with the boomers or the millennials? The truth is, that, like, this isn't a war. This is actually an opportunity to realize that power is moving younger to, to, to younger people faster than ever before. And then there's a collection of people who I, I consider a modern elder to not just be wise, but they're hopefully as curious as they are wise. Right. Well, also, not to sound too self-interested, but you, <laughs> you, you make a strong case in the book for a revival of the notion of elderhood in general. And you talk about the elders, which is the group that Nelson Mandela and Peter Gabriel had, yep. and, you know, have. Uh, and, and, and I find it very rational, I will say, that, <laughs> that we should have a more societal understanding that, especially as more and more baby boomers are planning to stick around. I mean, I'm not going, I'm not retired, I'm not going anywhere. And I think there's many millions of people like me, which you also, you know, you, you document in your book. Yeah, yeah. So, so is there the possibility of a real cultural shift? I, well, I think, <clears throat> let's be clear. I think that, I don't think that what I'm, I'm suggesting is we're going back to the elders of the past where all the power and hierarchy was with you know the men in, in, in a society who are older. No, no I'm not saying just yeah. white men like no, me. No, I know. I, so I think, but I, no, I, I know you didn't, but I just want to make you. sure. I think that modern elders are this pre premise that we are going to live longer, power is moving younger, and the world is changing faster. And there is, uh, in many organizations, there is a need to almost have people who are helping to coach and mentor and provide eldering services within organizations so those direct reports I had could learn from someone older than them around organizational savvy, EQ, and leadership skills. And so Google 20, you know, years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago maybe it was, created their 20% time for their engineers. Why don't we create a 20% or a 50% time for institutionalized wisdom within an organization. People who've been around for 10 years or longer, they're not growing any further on the organizational chart, but they've got really good savvy wisdom to offer. And reduce their scope if they want it, give them some leadership and coaching skills, and then have them in-house in operating oh. as sort of some wise It's the mentors. opposite of how a lot of companies operate, because if they have economic difficulties and they have rifts, they get rid of the more often the high-priced older people. I mean, I saw that happen at Time, Inc. With in spades, and it basically just more or less destroyed the institution. Let's recognize that ageism is the last socially acceptable um, bias in the workplace today, right. and especially in certain companies in Silicon Valley. Yeah, and you talked about this, that you know, people in their diversity met metrics and, and analysis generally don't even include age. So only 8% of companies, 8% of companies that have a diversity and inclusion program actually have included, have expanded it to include age. And that's recent, I would assume. And that's recent. And as, as, of, as of five years ago, it was 2%. So we do mm -hmm. see progress, but um, at part of it's the, let's just be honest, in many cases, ageism is actually the opposite of what I'm talking about. Ageism is not against old people, it's against young people. Yeah. And all the power rests with older people. So I think the basic point here is we have five generations in the workplace for the first time. Um, power is moving younger. Interesting, almost 40% of us have a boss younger than us uh, today. And in Silicon Valley, that number is even higher. By the year 2025, the majority of Americans will have a boss younger than them. We have no history for this. Um, and so we need to learn how to actually collaborate better as almost like an intergenerational potluck. Right. Yeah, I was just going to quote a, a phrase from your book, intergenerational collaboration, yeah. which is a really interesting and amazingly kind of a new concept. Yeah, yeah. it is. And I think that the companies that are actually able to figure it out will be able to tap into a study that came out this summer from MIT Sloan Management Journal, which basically showed the number one a metric for effective diversity on teams is age diversity, more so than race, gender, or sexual orientation, um, or even organizational background within an organization. Age diversity helps create more cognitive diversity because an, age, an older brain is different than a younger brain. An older brain, frankly, we know younger brains are focused, 
good at, they're fast, they have great memory. Older brain, not so good at those things. But older brains are more holistic and sort of a connect the dot synthetic thinker. And that often, that's part of the reason why Brian asked me to be the head of strategy for the company. As someone, when I joined at age 52, that's how much experience I had in the tech industry, zero. And so to be a head of strategy for a tech company was like, wow, that doesn't make sense. Um, but I, what Brian said is I like the way you connect the dots. Also, you could debate whether it really is a tech company. That's a debate that's underway. Yeah. But, um, you know, I want to talk about Airbnb for a minute, though, because <clears throat> even though it has gotten some flack recently for some serious problems, I think in general it's accepted to be a more maturely managed, well-balanced, you know, even to use Jeff Wiener's phrase, compassionately led company. And I would assume that's why they even welcomed you in in the first place. Um, do you think that, that, that there is something fundamentally different about Airbnb that, that has allowed it not to be tarred nearly as badly, at least, as, as some of the other uh, companies of its generation with, yeah. with malfeasance? I mean, I think, you know, uh, let's give credit to the three founders who, weirdly, 11 years into operating the business, are still actively involved in the business. Very few companies have three founders still that involved at this stage and at this valuation. So number one, they deserve credit. Number two, Brian as the CEO and one of the co-founders, before I joined seven years ago, he, his whole point of view was like, I want to go learn from the best people in the world, and I'm going to go out and you know, have the chutzpah to go ask you know, the former head of the CIA to tell me about trust and safety and security. And so Brian's been, um, has had the mindset that, yes, hubris is what actually raised him the money, but humility is what will make him a better leader. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you I, like know, I think I've been helpful with him on that. Um, and yes, he, I think he has shown some, some adeptness early on to actually have some age diversity on his leadership team. Uh, and that has led to maybe better decision making. We sort of saw early on that there were companies we didn't want to emulate that were constantly being compared to us, you know, back in seven years ago. And I mean, Uber? I, I'm not I mean, it say. used to be that you would say Uber and Airbnb it was like almost one company when we were talking about like the sharing economy or whatever we called the bullshit back then. Yeah, it was called yeah. the sharing economy. I, I now call the sharing economy sharing wisdom across generations. I won't say who it was or what the companies were because there's more than one. But there was definitely a sense that we need to actually create a culture that is our own and speaks to this idea that we are also a hospitality company. To be a disruptive hospitality company sounds like an oxymoron. So we better be different than other disruptive companies because we have hospitality built into the industry that we are disrupting. Hmm. I want to see if the audience has anything they want to chime in with questions or comments. And it is hard to see from up here. OK, there's a hand. Somebody of my generation, <laughs> who I happen to know. He doesn't have any Greg hair, Zach, so kind of Greg Zachary, I'm 64. <clears throat> OK, and yeah, so you're such two, a young guy, Greg. Two points, okay. and this is the first time that I've actually felt jarred and destabilized because this has been, I don't attend these very often anymore. Hold it close. And very clearly, you're in a bubble. I'll give you two areas that are very significant in American life that geriatrics dominate the worlds. One is universities. I work at a public university. 15% of the faculty is over 70. Yeah. They're not going anywhere. They just sound like Dave. They're not going to walk off stage. I, I have a different attitude personally. The second is our political realm where it seems like you know, there's a face-off among geriatrics, and that's just deepening. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, you would think she's 45. I mean, she's just at the top of the, her game. So there's no dirty secret here. People in their 75s, 80s, they're supposed to be really top, top class. We're supposed to buy that. We're supposed to eat Wait, that. Wait, so you're saying that suggests his premise no, is wrong? No, let me, let me finish. So the third area is the military. Young people fight. But who runs the military? It's structurally biased towards old people. So it's really nice that there is a world like Silicon Valley where young people run things. And, and I have the same problem. I'll say to people in Silicon Valley, I was big in the 90s. They don't know if I'm talking about the 1890s or <laughs> what 90s. You were big in the 90s. And you were and too, they Greg. shrug and <clears throat> walk away. 
Because it's, it is, you are right, that they can benefit from older people, and it's great that you've tapped into it, but the rest of our society is doing the opposite. You're wrong. I'm sorry. 45% <laughs> of Americans today have a boss, I'm sorry, 40% of Americans today have a boss that's younger than them. Um, that number was 12% 25 years ago. That number is going to be over 50% by the year 2025. Advertising industry, all entertainment industry, uh, investment banking, there's a growing number of industries that are saying, we need to be, we need more DQ. We need more digital intelligence. Let's go out and find someone who's young and smart, and they can't, you know, and they're, you know, they're getting sued now as well. But I, 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 I hate to say, go straight with, you're wrong, but I agree with you. That was my initial premise when I started doing the research three years ago. And then what I saw and was, was backed up in interviews is that more and more industries are using the tech industry as their model. Right. And that's really where things are going. I agree with you, though. The three, the three industries you suggested. Universities, not the US military. No, exactly. I, th <laughs> those three industries, I totally agree with you. But you know, when you go from 12% to 40% in 25 years in terms of the number of people who actually have a boss that's younger than them, and, and that number is going to only ra rise. Because here's the other thing that's happening. If you are 55 years old, and I'm 59, if you're 55 years old, 70% of us have a boss that's younger than us. As more and more people stay in the workplace longer, and we, we've seen the retirement, you know, the, the retirement revolution is people are not retire, retiring at 60 or 65 anymore. And as people stay in the workplace longer, they're going to have a younger boss. So power will be moving younger. So, I, I mean, I, we could have... <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Just wait for AOC, Greg, and it'll be solved. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just realized you actually thought I was under 59. I love that. That's, that's, that's so nice. That's when I started this company, which is kind of your, your, your ad advocacy that we should be doing. Well, and let, the interesting thing, the fastest growing age demographic of entrepreneurs in this country by far is people 50 and older. And lots of data this, in the last year has shown that they're more successful and effective than entrepreneurs age 30. Hey, it worked here. Okay, who else has another one? Okay, ooh, very high raised hand back there. Okay, do we have? A, okay, you got the mic. Identify yourself. Hi, my name is Katherine Harrison. I'm the founder of the Deep Trust Alliance. I'm going to ask a very controversial question, um, and let me start by saying I agree with you in terms of the need for emotional intelligence to be transferred from people that have more of it to some of the younger generations. But people over the age of 55 have been shown to share fake news, misinformation, and disinformation seven times more than other populations. Oh, wow. So I think there's, I love your thoughts in terms of this audience as it relates to those questions yeah. is an elite and very special group. How do you think about really that intergenerational learning that has to happen yeah. and the trust that we need to instill in the ways that we communicate digitally and otherwise. In 37 so, seconds, please. Yeah, so quick, quickly, uh, almost a, I, I love the okay, a little bit of OK Boomer there. So it's a, totally agree, <laughs> totally agree. We I'm, should have played that. I thing. am with you. Um, and this is part of the reason we created the Modern Elder Academy. There's a growing number of people who are 45 and older who feel irrelevant. It's called the irrelevance gap. As, as power get, moves old, uh, I'm sorry, as we live old, longer, power moves younger, they don't know what to do with themselves, and, they, and that irrelevance, they, they l l end up learning fake news. How we teach people how to mine their mastery and reapply their wisdom and maybe start cultivating some emotional intelligence is part of why we created the world's first midlife wisdom school, but most importantly, made it scho a scholarship program so that we have a lot of people who frankly can't afford to go to school, and so 62% of our people are on scholarship. Because having an investment banker who's 45 and retired but has no purpose but lots of money walk down the beach with a 62-year-old social worker who has no money but lots of purpose, they can learn from each other. And to me, that's the ultimate here is that, yes, if we have a growing number of people feeling irrelevant, um, they are going to actually start doing things as stupid as believing all the fake news they've, that they've been believing. Wow. Well. Great to have you. Thank you. Again, the book, Thanks. Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. I read it before our prep call. 